Hey y'all, this is Kobe R. Rice and I'm back again for another weekly, dare I say weekly, when it's really been three months. Anyway, weekly creative update. So, as you guys know, I am Kobe R. Rice, novelist, screenwriter, TV writer, filmmaker, producer, director, dramaturg, game designer, narrative designer, etc., etc., etc. And it has been quite a while quite a while y'all um because i've been so insanely busy and when i say insanely busy i really do mean from literally 4 30 a.m all the way up until about 7 30 p.m almost every single night starting whew, from mid to late october until just about a week ago <laughs> <laughs> and um, even prior to that, my hours were more 4.30 a.m. until about 5.30 p.m., 6 p.m., and then I still have my commute and everything like that. So, and six days a week for about half of that time that I've been gone, I've been basically pulling that schedule for about six days a week. So things have been really just off the meat rack. <laughs> I don't know how else to say it. Completely off the meat rack. So I have been away because my current career path is honing me and training me and putting me through a crucible of fire and blood and sweat and tears so that I can become like a better teacher and a better person. But um, I am here to give let's just get right into the tea i am here to give my 2019 creative achievements roundup and despite the fact that i have had limited time an insane amount of work and a lot of other crazy things going on this year this year has actually been relatively fruitful and i'm really excited about that so we're just going to jump right into it i'm in the computer room at my house um, happy holidays, by the way, people. I'm in the computer room at my house. I'm going to move this microphone over here, trying to grab about an hour's worth of privacy so that I can essentially record this uninterrupted. Okay, so we're going to see how well that works out. But basically, let's see. So <laughs> how do I start? 2019 has probably been one of the most challenging years that I've had in a while. In a while, maybe since 2016. 2016 was like really rough. 2015, 2014 were like the roughest years of my entire life to date. But 2019 has been certainly a challenge. Hold on, moving the mic again. I just need to find like a good place to put this so I'm not looking off screen and looking crazy. Okay, 2019 has been ex extremely challenging. And excuse me for those of you who are watching the actual video version, I'm recording on my actual large screen IMAX, so I'm not looking as directly into the camera like I would usually be looking. Um, I'm actually looking at my notes, which are like somewhere over here. So I'm sorry if I'm not making direct eye contact. But um, 2019 has been really insane in terms of major challenges, major hardships, major life changes that have made things really difficult. And I'm not even gonna beat around the bush about it. I'm not gonna go into specific detail because you know, even though this is a really open podcast, I'm trying to keep it more focused on my journey and my career as a writer, director, game designer, filmmaker, etc. Um, so I want to keep it focused on that, focus on construct construction, constructivity, positivity, and um, just documenting my journey. At the same time, even though I'm not going into specifics, I will be very open and say this year has been kicking my butt in many ways outside of my career, outside of the things that are happening with me creatively. And that has ultimately come to have an impact on my productivity on just my desire to be on the battlefield, the creative battlefield, swinging my sword. 
I needed to take a lot more time to rest and reflect and to, how do you say, to retreat, reorganize and regroup (laughs) Um, and get my attack plan on point. So I will definitely say that. You guys know that I have a publishing press called Rebel Ragdoll Press. I'm working on finishing um, up pre-production and the script and things like that for the TV series version of a concept that I'm developing. It might still be a film version as well, and that's going to be all done under Rebel Ragdoll Productions. Um, You guys know that I am... I recently, in the past year, completely revamped and uh, rebooted The Bohemian Badass, which is an online school for burgeoning creatives, for people who want to learn how to write plays, write screenplays, write novels, direct theater, direct, direct films, produce, things like that. So I have a very full, very busy life outside of what I do on the day to day. And this podcast is a part of that life. So let's get into it. This is the part where I itemize exactly the specific skills that I've gained. So theatrical season and program development, TV script writing and TV series development. That was a big one this year and last year. Adaptation dramaturgy, meaning from classical works to modernized works, specifically in the sci-fi fantasy genres. Contract drafting self-advocacy, script development, coverage, event planning, marketing and social media campaigns, creating pitch decks just a little bit. Definitely got into studying a lot about pitch decks and how those work, and I have been very excited about developing my skills in that area. Negotiation and mediation, resume writing, applying to jobs, and interviewing. That was literally my entire summer, my entire summer. I, ha- I must have applied to like 600 plus jobs, like no, and I'm not even exaggerating, like not even exaggerating. So definitely got a major insane crash, co- crash course in that. Lesson planning, which I already had experience with, but has been a refresh since I became a theater teacher recently. Obviously I have to like do more lesson planning. And um, behavior management. <laughs> I'm just gonna keep it real. Um, definitely had to develop skills in that. Um, especially because moving from a college ivory tower setting is very different in terms of being a teacher. Moving from that setting into the setting of an urban high school, um, there are challenges in both that do not exist in the other. So um, just keeping it real on that. So some really great skills that I've developed this year. I'm really excited about that. I've actually also learned some very key lessons about how to manage one's career on the day-to-day. Like when you're working for um, a boss and organization um, and employee, as an employee, etc. I have learned some key lessons, which I will share maybe on a future podcast. We will see. All right, moving on. End of graduate school reflections. Um, as you guys know, a major, major milestone and achievement for me this year was me getting my MFA, my second master's, but the second being that it's an MFA in theater arts with a focus on generative dramaturgy. Yay. And um, sort of a minor focus was also directing, which I am super into. I super love. It is definitely up my alley. Definitely what I want to do as a part of my persona as an artist. Directing is my thing. I love it. And in terms of how how far and how, let's say, um, how far and how wide I've had to travel to get this MFA, whew, this is a massive achievement. As you guys know, my MFA program was the first of its kind at the University of Arizona. And I was a part of a six person inaugural cohort who were basically tasked with the duty of getting through the program, but also helping to shape the program for future cohorts and future generations. And um, unfortunately, while the program has been put on hiatus, Okay, I talked about that in a few podca- a few podcasts ago. 
um, I learned a lot and I came through a lot, not just that program, but just in life in general. Um, the past three years from literally mid 2016 to mid 2019 have been such an amazing journey, a challenging and difficult journey, but an amazing and necessary one. And it helped me to reestablish myself. It helped me to rediscover myself. It helped me to gain so many amazing skills these past three years. I didn't even know really what dramaturgy was when I came into the program. And now I feel like I'm actually very good at it. And it is a tool that I consistently use, not just in theater, but like across all of my artistic mediums like novel writing definitely use dramaturgy you guys know that this year i did an adaptation of william shakespeare's uh roman history tetralogy and i took all those all four of those classical works and turned that into a cyberpunk noir world and story called when in rome which launched the beginning of like one, my TV series portfolio, just like as something I can show people. And secondly, it also kicked off the first episode of a novelized, serialized series that I was supposed to get out this year in prose form, in novella form, but I didn't. So that's going to be coming out next year. But I mean, that was just the culmination of the program. I learned how to direct. I learned how to be a dramaturg. I learned um, theater history and theory, even though you guys know how I feel about theory, but I still learned it. I learned how to be a dramaturg in a, for experimental theater, classical theater, new works. Um, I have been thoroughly trained in all three areas and would be an asset to any theater company and any theater department, any theater education program. Just, yeah, absolutely. We did playwriting as well. And then of course was a major, a major part of it was a directing component, which um, who gets to direct ever in a dramaturgy program? Like in most programs, you either get to be a dramaturg or you get to direct. And I got to do both. And I got to do dramaturgy Oh, not just in three areas, but in four areas, that being actually five areas. So experimental, classical, new work, musical dramaturgy for musicals and adaptation dramaturgy. So I got trained in five different areas. Now, musical and adaptation dramaturgy are the ones that I pursued more independently that were not built into the program itself, but it was still an amazing experience and I loved it, and I even wrote my own mini musical throughout the course of my grad program. And as you guys know, it's the story of the hip hop, the hip hop musical um, of uh, Morian the Moor, who was the first Black Knight of the Arthurian Round Table, which is still in progress. And I'm actually shopping that around currently right now to different theaters so I can develop it more. Um, and then adaptation dramaturgy, I just told you about when in Rome. So I was able to really make the most of the program, not only academically, but also entrepreneurially. I opened up two more businesses, so to speak, while I was in the program, um, one being New Adult Noir, another being The Bohemian Badass, which I'm still developing. And I, oh, actually three, because I established Rebel Ragdoll Productions as well while I was here and um, a bunch of other brands that are kind of still sitting in the ether. So um, that was great on a professional level and finishing this out this year and just reflecting on how good graduate school was to me, not just professionally, but also just personally, um, that was a major, major boon to my 2019. I mean, I was happy to leave because by the end of the program, there were a whole bunch of things happening that, I, that were just kind of just too much and too crazy but still like I will never downplay the impact that this program has had on my life as a person and um I did a major reboot major reboot on a personal front on an emotional front on a mental front 
And um, that was all due to my being in Tucson and healing and rebirthing and creating for these past three years. So um, it's been, that was a really amazing journey, one that I was happy to finish and move on with, but um, I grew so much and I'm so grateful. So that was a major accomplishment for me. The MFA as a final point was also the point, not the first point, but like a major point at which I was able to proclaim to the world, I am artist. (laughs) I am artist. I am artist so much that I am straight up getting a degree in it. Okay. Not saying that you have to have a degree to actually be an artist. Like obviously you don't need a degree, but getting a degree in theater, getting a degree in creative writing, in painting, in photography, in filmmaking, that is a pretty ballsy declaration to the world and to the universe of what it is you want to do. You know, Um, and that's not to downplay people who are choosing to be engineers, but who also do these things on the side or in a sort of parallel sort of way. But people who really say, this is my career, this is me, like this is what I'm putting on every single resume that I send out into the world. Claiming that is a huge, huge deal, especially in a world that's not particularly supportive, in my opinion, of artists. Because in a capitalist society, art rarely has the kind of value that we value as human beings. And so we have deliberately chosen to buck a lot of that. Not saying that we don't like money. We do love money. We do need money. And there are definitely ways to make money off of your art. But we all know starting out, that's not how it is. And that's not how art works. And even knowing that, still choosing to focus on that and to proclaim that, to put that in writing is a huge deal. So that was sort of my second coming out, you know, where in my, as I, as you guys know, my first coming out was me leaving my 20, um, leaving my, uh, 2009 to 2013 PhD program in sociology, um, for the artistic life. But like, so that was like my first artistic coming out. And the second one was actually getting the degree in 2019. So kudos to me. Yes. Um, (laughs) I know you guys are like sitting here listening to me ramble being like, when is she going to actually get to like the itemized things that she actually did this year creatively? I'm getting there. Okay. But I'm trying to acknowledge the other parts of my life. Okay. Um, who in the health zone child all right i have been my health has been on fleek one really fantastic thing that has come out um of these past three months in particular is that i have dropped another 10 plus pounds and i am super excited about it okay um i have been on like an improve my health journey since uh mid 2018 yeah mid 2018 that was like the summer of 2018 where I was just like I need to reclaim my life (laughs) I'm gonna drop this baby weight I'm gonna be out here just looking good feeling good doing my thing and um since 2018 since the summer of 2018 I dropped a total of 21.1 pounds but 10 of those I lost in the past three months because I like just my day-to-day schedule (laughs) forces me to um, eat a little differently. So I've kind of decided on, not not on purpose, but my schedule is that I'll eat like a really big heavy meal in the morning. And then I literally will not eat again um, until probably like 8 p.m. where I have like a smaller meal. So uh, there's kind of like a 12 hour, literally like a 12 hour time frame between my meals. And I'm not saying that like, that's the healthiest way to go about it, or that's the way I recommend. I'm not a nutritionist. I'm not a doctor, but it's just how, it's just the way that it worked out. And, um, just having fewer calorie heavy meals has just obviously had an impact. Um, cause my meals that I do have are calorie heavy when I have them. But uh, I don't have that many of them. And on top of it, because I'm a teacher and because I take public transportation every single day, 
I end up walking 10,000 plus steps per day. Also, I am awake longer, which means my body is burning more calories. As I told you, I wake up at 4.30 to be able to leave here around 6 o'clock to get to work by 7.30, drop my kid off at school, and I am basically working um, from 7.30 a.m. to about 5.30 p.m. if it's a regular school day because we have school ends about, you know, 4, 4.30. 4.30 actually it ends. But then we have meetings and stuff like that after school. So from 4.30 a.m. to 5.30 p.m., it's getting ready, it's commuting, it's actually working the full day. And then if I have rehearsal, and not if, when I have rehearsal, because I'm now actively directing shows, that's going to usually be from about 4.45 until about 6.37, about 6.30 p.m. Um, and then usually after the rehearsals are over, I have my director's meeting with a co-director who I direct my shows with, who's amazing, who I love. Uh, but, you know, there's a lot of logistical stuff when you're doing a director, when you're being a director of a show, in addition to the artistic, creative, I'm directing your body on stage kind of stuff. And since we don't really have currently any trained stage managers who really know how to take care of the logistics and get those off of our plate, we have to do that part of the production as well. So... That is literally a 15 hour day. And then I commute home and I eat something and I go straight to bed. <laughs> so it's literally sleep, work, sleep, work, grab my meals when I can. Um, and then I'm on my feet basically that entire time from 7.30 a.m. to um, 6.30 p.m. Usually just on my feet all day. So that has contributed to a rapid drop in my weight, which is even better. I'm almost at my goal. I'm looking to lose another um, 18, 18 pounds. And that's most because like I want to start bulking up. So it's going to be like 18 down in like body composition um, and, and like body fat, but like I'm going to try to gain 10 of those pounds back and like just muscle. So step by step incrementally, um, I'm getting to my health goals, but today, this year, 2019, amazing for health goals. The only thing that I would improve actually is that um, I choose more healthful meals. So I want to include a little bit more greens and um, more fiber in my diet. And then I'm pretty much good to go. So health for 2019 on fleek. Grad school 2019, challenges, but on fleek. Um, let's see. What else do I want to talk about? Okay. So let's finally get into the <laughs> portfolio achievements. <laughs> I know you guys are just like, she, she's been gone for three months and now she comes back and it's just rambling like a darn fool. Listen, y'all, okay, my portfolio achievements this year, again, despite all of the personal and professional challenges, has been mwah, molto bene, molto bene. Oh, oh, amazing. So I have, in the novel section of my life, I've published a lock-in as an ebook, as a paperback, and I just, maybe only three days ago, hit the publish button on the lock and audiobook. So the audiobook, which is recorded by the amazing Michael T. Bradley, will be coming out for your pleasure, your perusal, okay? Just everything that you ever wanted and you were waiting for in the next week or so. I hope that it's out by the 31st of this year, but if not, it's okay. I don't care. I published it this year. I produced it this year, and that's all that matters. Um, and it is so good. It is so good. Um, Michael is so talented and I just can't wait. I can't wait for you guys to meet the characters in book three. If you haven't read the actual book itself, um, let me lift this. Now we're cooking with grease. There we go. Just raising the blinds here. Um, if you guys haven't read the eBooks already, if you haven't um, read the paperback, that's okay. Grab the audiobook and 
it's going to be fire. And the reason why it's going to be even more fire, aside from the fact that it is brilliantly narrated, brilliantly done, is that finally I am moving into non-exclusive contracts with ACX, which means that I can not only legally publish and sell and distribute on multiple other platforms, but I can also choose the price point. Finally, I can choose my own price point for my audiobooks. So personally, you know, I think the audiobooks should be just as much, maybe a teeny bit more than the, uh, than the ebook and the paperback. And I should be able to package those together at my will and give you guys specials and discounts. If you want to buy all three audiobooks all together but get a discount, I should be able to do that for y'all, right? I mean, hello. Um, and I was not able to do that with ACX and with their current exclusive agreement. So my narrator and I worked out um, some terms on our own, which means that I'm going to have to cut him checks on my own from my publishing press, which I have no problem paying him. I just never wanted to be responsible for anybody else's royalties or checks. <laughs> but I'm going to have to be now that um, he and I have, have done a different deal. And But in exchange for that, I am now able to distribute at least the lock-in, audiobook number three, anywhere that I want, including on my own website, and sell that to you guys at a discounted price. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, the first two books of my series, the first two audiobooks specifically, The Given and The Taken, those will not be available for free sale <laughs> for my little free-for-all until August of 2020. So hopefully by then I'll actually have the next two books of Ezekiel out and the next two audiobooks ready to go such that I can release, re-release all five of them in one big, fat, massive, amazingly priced volume at the end of 2020. That's sort of what my goal is right now. So we'll see. Okay, but that's what's been happening this year. Publish the lock-in, ebook, paperback, and audiobook. I also edited and published the omnibus for the books of Ezekiel for the first three books. So if you haven't read the first three books and you want to get them at a discounted price, all three, the given, the taken, and the lock-in are available in one box and one bundle, e-bundle, online, amazon.com, and through other retailers as well at the wonderful price of $2.99. So go and check that out. It is literally a thousand plus pages of nonstop action, alchemy, magic, sci-fi, just like grittiness, crime noir. I mean, not safe for kids. <laughs> like, this is new adult. This is not young adult. So don't get it twisted. Your child should probably be at least 17 before they pick these books up. But mwah, I love it. I have also co-published and... Um, yeah, co-published the ebook version and the paperback version of Everdark, which is our urban fantasy detective duo paranormal mystery book that um, was written by myself and JT Lawrence, who is now a USA Today bestselling author. Yay, JT. Um, and it's available online at Amazon.com. I believe that's the only place it's available right now. But if you're interested, definitely go pick up that book. We busted our rumps on it. We worked really hard on it. And I personally think it's a very, very, very well-written book. And it's also going to serve, at least for me, as the prequel to my own spinoff series called Shaw and Salick, following my main character and another character I created for Everdark. Those two pair off. And while um, my main character is living in the Bronx, because that's where she lives, um, they are solving their own mysteries, dealing with what's happening in the magical world of New York City. As you guys know, just to kind of do my little marketing pitch, um, there are a few series I'm working on myself called The Forever Files, The Hitman of Happily Ever After, and The Godsman. <clears throat> and to a certain extent, The Right Hand, those four other series all those series take place in this unfolding world of New York City, magical New York City, where fairy tales, 
and fairy tale creatures and monsters and heroes are all coming to life, but are manifesting in like a very crime noir, um, you know, black market underbelly way in the boroughs of New York City. And so the Shaw and Salick series, which is like series number, let me get my hand over here, series number five in that world is just this detective duo moving through that world. And so between Shaw and Salick, the right hand, happily, um, happily, the hitman of happily ever after, the Forever Fowls and the Godsmen, there's going to be a lot of crossover. So if these were like five different TV series, you are going to see a lot of different crossover episodes because all five of these series take place around the same time in the same world, but just following different characters with different missions. So um, super excited about that. And I hope to introduce that world sometime in early 2021. That's what it's looking like right now. The reason why I say early 2021 is because of all of the development, world building, and plotting and drafting that I've been doing around other series that have been much more um, imminent and much more immediate and necessary. So we'll get to that in just a minute. But um, moving on into TV writing. So that's what I've done for my novel publishing. TV writing, as I told you guys, I finished developing the TV Bible for When in Rome, at least the first full first draft of it. I definitely have to go back and work more on building out the world and building out, you know, the history and everything like that. World building takes time, but I have something very solid to show any sort of, if I wanted to take this to like a network or a studio, it's all together and I'm really excited. I also have finished the first very strong TV pilot for When in Rome. And as I told you guys a million times before, but I want to repeat myself, When in Rome is a um, is an adaptation of William Shakespeare's Roman history plays into a cyberpunk noir kind of um, tech thriller-ish world in the future. So um, I'm really excited about that. It's something that you've never really seen. Like we have not legit seen roman history and william shakespeare's roman history plays developed into this kind of cyberpunk noir world and i'm excited to just make it happen so i got dibs anybody who tries to come in here and tries to play me and you know no (laughs) this is my idea all mine 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 and i love it and i'm excited that i was able to actually finish that and actually add it to my tv writing portfolio for the future and for you know 2019. Okay, before I get into development, world building, and plotting and drafting, I'm going to kind of skip over that really quickly because that's a really long section and I just want to get all the other sections out of the way first. So directing has been on fleek this year. I directed and opened a 10-minute play called Choice Choice this summer at the Long Island City Play Festival at the Secret Theater and that was really amazing. Big ups to my amazing actors Theo and Alexis and to the amazing playwright David Wei, or uh, David Liu, I'm sorry, <laughs> Wei Liu, David Liu, um, amazing team, really enjoyed working together with them, and I had another chance to work with them again, but I was so busy with my new job, which is being a theater teacher, I wasn't able to really engage in the new project, but um, we are still, we still all have like a great relationship, we're going to take more of David's plays out into the world and shop them around for development. And um, I look forward to working more with you guys in the future. I really enjoyed it. The play was really great. It got a lot of really wonderful feedback. And um, that was great. And then I also co-directed, co-produced, and opened, co-opened Romeo and Juliet at um, the high school at which I am currently working. And it was an amazing piece of work, especially considering the challenges that we encountered, including the fact that we weren't even able to start doing auditions until late October, which only gave us six weeks to put this play up. Six weeks to put up a three-hour play (laughs) with all of the problems and challenges and unpleasant surprises that come along with doing productions. You guys know sometimes um, things get lost Sometimes admin takes really long. 
sometimes um, you hit some just general like scheduling roadblocks or you know there are challenges with the cast or you know people drop out or they can't do it anymore or scripts get lost like we dealt with all of the problems of a regular production but at the same time uh, we only had six weeks and that included dramaturging the play itself to cut it down. We cut out probably over 50% of the original script. And um, there was a lot of dramaturgy there in terms of like looking at what parts of the play were absolutely a thousand percent essential. And even some emergency dramaturgy wherein, oh my Lord. And this is why I'm so grateful for my graduate school experience because the fact that like I was able to manage this major emergency situation was just mind blowing. Literally the day of our final performance, one of our actors got sick. She became very ill. One of the main actors of the play became ill. <clears throat> and so literally two hours before we are opening the house, okay, two hours before we're opening the house, I am sitting there in the audience like actors are on stage crews on stage trying to get it together you know just furiously editing this play like just editing out that actor's parts and then <laughs> finding some magical weaving way to put this play back together such that it still made sense and it still flowed even though this main major character was no longer a part of the play. Do you know how hard it is to do that two hours before you're supposed to be opening the house for your final performance? And uh, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm patting myself on the back, patting my co-director on the back, you know, who gave his insights, and then patting my cast and my crew on the back for being able to maneuver that, that major, major change just two hours before we opened, um, which was extremely stressful and extremely crazy, but they did that. They did it, and I am so proud of them. These are high school students, and they were exhibiting the professionalism of veteran actors, okay? We had to go over and reblock and rework scenes and um, re-memorize, like memorize new lines on the fly. And also, I had to go through and redo the lighting cues because once you cut scenes out of an already teched show, you have to sort of re-tech it, right? So then I had to do that with the lighting designer. Child, considering everything that we had to do before we, before we did this, oh my gosh, um, that show was the bomb. And I can only imagine what's coming in the future. Uh, as a matter of fact, I already know what's coming in the future. We actually get to now co-direct for the spring literally in like a week we start working on the color purple the musical and we are so incredibly excited so um directing has been amazing this year i am super excited and super blessed and privileged and lucky i'm just going to be frank that i get to as a part of my job description direct and put up at least two shows a year and still, over the summer, I have time to put up my own shows um, or do my own film directing. So I'm really grateful for my career. I'm really grateful for the things that are built into my job description that are keeping me activated and active in the process of creation and in the process of directing. And being a theater teacher is not easy. It's very challenging. Um, but... Everything that I want to do is packed into what I have to do, <laughs> if that makes any sense. I don't know how to say it better. Um, and I'm really grateful for that. For that, And um, I'm really grateful for my kids because uh, I, we get to pick kids who are genuinely invested and interested in the craft of theater making and work with them to create something beautiful and amazing. And that's just amazing. So directing has been on fleek. Dramaturgy, I mentioned this before, but in addition to actually writing the TV Bible and writing the pilot, like I actually had to engage with adaptation skills that I learned from my program. 
and do adaptation drama, uh, dramaturgy, adaptation drama and adaptation dramaturgy, if that makes sense, for um, When in Rome. I also, um, as I said, did a lot of <laughs> both in production and on the fly dramaturgy for Romeo and Juliet. And then on top of that, for my summer job, I did a lot of dramaturgy and script development um, on scripts that were coming in to my entertainment company that I was working for. And I got to develop the entire portfolio of a crime noir thriller writer um, whose work I really enjoyed. So I had that experience of looking into how at least one thriller writer writes his work, giving my perspective, my objective opinion on the things that made sense, the holes, the character development and things like that. So that not only gave me some real life practice, but it also gave me more pieces to put into my portfolio with regard to coverage and dramaturgy and development, which I'm really grateful about. So um, great successes on that front. Um, I also did a little bit of marketing this year. As I, as I told you guys before, in the beginning of the year, this year was more about <clears throat> content creation and what else? I called this the year of content creation and something else. It was called the year of the content creator, the year of the marketer, the year of creative uni, and the year of health, body, and glow up goals. Glow up goals, right? Um, and I actually had to, in pursuit of being a better content marketer, I actually dropped a content creator, excuse me, in the pursuit of being a better content creator, is what I meant to say, I actually had to drop the marketing standpoint, which I'm happy to have done. Um, We'll get into that in a different podcast, but <clears throat> this year, I really wanted to focus on the making of the thing. I don't have anything really to market if I don't have anything in my portfolio. And I do now, you know, I mean, this year alone, I directed two shows. I dramaturged, um, you know, uh, more, some more projects. So those two things are going into my portfolio. I uh, also... Um, published two books, an audio book, paperbacks, etc. So I'm getting there, but I want to up my productivity even more this coming year. So because of that, I will probably be more focused once again on content creation and less on marketing this year. <clears throat> so that's sort of my plan. And I think I was able to fulfill most of those goals this year. Um, so that's that. For branding and business development, I completely rebooted my Kobe R. Rice website at the beginning of the year. It looks gorgeous. I love it. I probably won't be changing it up for a while because I love it so much. I still need to add a workable store. And um, once I sort of figure out what all that looks like, I'll probably do that as a mini project throughout this year. But my website looking is looking on point. I also worked on the Bohemian Badass website and brand. And I also developed a few lessons. I'm trying to look and see. Some theater lessons, because I've been working on theater lessons the entire, you know, not the entire year, but like since September. And um, I'm also in development for a two-day writing school, like a live event two-day writing school. So I already have the outline for it, and I'm just trying to figure out what more of the logistics are going to look like for 2020. So I'm still in development on those brands. Um, I'm trying my best to work on them as much as possible and sort of do like a semi-shadow development on those brands. And for career, I already went through this, but I finished my three-year three year MFA program and received my MFA in theater arts. That was from January to May. Then I trained very diligently in a summer internship as a talent management and script development, script development assistant from June to August, um, the beginning of June to the end of August. So it was like a full-on summer ex internship experience, which was great. And now I have a um, really amazing full-time job as a theater teacher. Definitely has its challenges, but I always continue to try to reflect on 
the benefits and the challenges at the same time. So there's a balanced perspective. So career has been actually really on point this year. And I feel like I've been taking progressive steps. Like I went from the educational realm. Then I did a summer internship, which wasn't paid much, but was still paid and helped me to keep myself afloat for the summer to a full-time career, (laughs) which is great and sort of semi unheard of now in today's economy and something that I wasn't able to really achieve in the past 10 years. Like in 2009, as you guys will recall from my former stories, like when I graduated from my undergrad program and I had a one-way ticket to my PhD program, I considered going into the working world instead. And basically there were no jobs and it was impossible to get hired anywhere. So I went from that in 2009 to now 2019, coming out with my second master's, uh, my beautiful daughter, all my experience and my changes in the past 10 years. And basically the summer after I graduated, stepping into a full-time career in my field. So um, I'm definitely you know, counting my blessings and not just counting my blessings, but also giving me my well-deserved props, you know, as, cause I worked very hard to be where I am. So it, nothing was given to me, it was earned. At the same time, um, we do temper confidence with the fact that I didn't have to be chosen, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? So I consider this a blessing. So those are my achievements in directing, dramaturgy, marketing, branding, and business building, and career prospects. Um, So let's get back really quickly into development and world building and plotting and drafting. Because you guys know that even though I publish, I'm trying my best now to publish at least two, hopefully four books next year, but I'm trying to keep my publishing game on point after like a five-year kind of dud period, uh, I still in the interim and working on other series. So this year I worked on one, two, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, nine series, okay? I've been shadow developing this entire year of 2019. So the first has been obviously the Books of Ezekiel series, not so much shadow development as much as just like, active. I need to get these books out. <laughs> Development. So I've been engaging in a lot of plotting, story gritting, scene design, world building, actual writing and drafting up drafts of the next novels, which are Fraternity, which is book number four, and Hollow Point, which is book number five. Hollow Point is going to be insanity. Um, <laughs> Fraternity is really just me finishing up the events of book three, which is the lock-in. But Hollow Point is where we really get into the tea. Fraternity is going to be really good. But Hollow Point is going to be, oh, oh, gosh. And then I also did more first drafting for book number 10, which is the House of Death series. And I I still can't explain why the House of Death is so clear in my mind, but I think it's a major, massive turning point in the direction of Ezekiel's journey. And so that turning point is very clear to me, I believe. But it's still getting done, so I'm happy about that. The other series I've been working on, series number two out of nine, is called the Sons of Exodus series. And this is actually the four book prequel to the Books of Ezekiel series, where we are following two of our lovely main characters, along with, I think we're following three to four others kind of intermittently, but um, two main ones to basically show what has happened prior to the events of the books of Ezekiel series so that we understand exactly how Ezekiel got to where she is, how another character got to where he was, because I don't want to reveal too much of the series if you guys haven't read it yet, Um, and just all the things and machinations that went into how Ezekiel's home and country essentially got to where it was politically at the beginning of the books of Ezekiel. I'm really excited uh, for the Sons of Exodus series. And I think all four books, no, 
all but one of the four books is actually titled in the series. And I know pretty much exactly what the plot is going to be for each book. Um, so that plotting and world building and drafting has actually been going very well this year. And I'm really excited about that. And I'm actually hoping to, after I release Hollow Point, my, my goal after having released Hollow Point, which is book number five in Books of Ezekiel, is to release all four books of the Sons of Exodus, either one after another or all at the same time. I think I might do the book release one after another. Um, like month by month, but we'll see. I have to actually finish writing them first, right? And writing is actually really hard. <laughs> as much as I love it, it's hard for me. Um, another series that I've been developing across multiple mediums, not, not just film and TV, but also the novel and prose mediums is the Sandman series. You guys know that I am working on uh, developing a the pre-production and the script for the Sandman film this coming summer which I'm also trying to turn into a TV series, episodic series somehow. I don't know how I'm gonna do that, but um, I was like really set on it being a film and then I was really set on it being a TV series and now I think I'm set on doing both. But like the structure to both is very different and I'm trying to choose one to focus on. So we'll probably do the film this summer, probably do like a film series and then um, I'll find a way to turn that film series into an eight episode TV series. Still in progress, but um, I worked on the TV Bible this year, the script development and pre-production tasks. The con uh, one piece of preliminary concept art has been commissioned and I'm excited about that, but I'm looking for something more horrific. So I think I'm gonna go back and do some more shopping around as to um, artists who can really bring the horror of Sandman to life. So we'll see. Um, and I also have been in the course of developing the story and the series and just the backbone of the TV and film versions. I've also decided to turn these four films, this eight episode TV series into a novel tetralogy. Because you guys know I'm all about doing transmedia and multimedia things. And I also believe in cultivating. Sorry, I heard some screaming. <laughs> I also believe in cultivating the um, multiple streams of income that I would like to develop. And so if people would prefer to read Sandman in a novelized format, they will have it, <laughs> a four book novel series. So I've been working on developing that this, this year as well. For the Asylum series, you guys know I'm been, I've am been working pretty heavy, hardcore on that. Um, plotting, world building, character development. I also have done a lot of writing for the series as a whole and specifically for Sodom, which is the first book in the series. Sodom, which is the first book of the series and Asylum, which is the fourth book in the series. Um, Right now, my novel titles are uh, Sodom, Lustrum, Sanctum, which is basically the prequel trilogy to the Asylum series. I'm doing prequel trilogies now. I don't know why. Then there's Asylum, Bedlam, and Hoodlum. And I'm excited for both. Both trilogies are kind of like, are connected, but are unique in their own ways, especially in terms of genre focus. And I've just been working on developing the entire world, the entire plot the entire character population for that series as a matter of fact i got super ahead in world building in the past week because i've been off you know we've had um, our christmas and new year's break since starting friday so i have been diligently working on world building and plotting for the asylum series and got a lot done in the past week so i'm excited about that um, then, of course, developing the When in Rome series, I drafted a really crappy first draft of the prose version of When in Rome, the first novella, um, and that's basically the where I am on that series. I have also decided in my mind, um, since there's not really much movement going on um, in terms of my former partnership on the When in Rome series, that I'm going to also move forward with a spinoff series um, for that, that 
is um, related to the when in Rome world, but takes place after when in Rome concludes. And that's all that I will say on that. I am moving forward on that project um, because it needs to be done. And it can't just sit in the ether not being touched. Um, I also have been working on a series called The Forgotten. So I developed the series structure and also mm -hmm. did a lot of drafting. Oh, let me put on the do not disturb button here. So you don't hear more of those little chimes. <laughs> so did a lot of drafting and series development for the Forgotten series. Um, whew, another series I'm super excited about called Surrogate. I have done some plotting for the Surrogate series. Super amped about that. That is basically being written in the form of a TV series and a serialized novella series. You guys know that I've made a distinction between those two and how they're related in former podcasts, but um, there is a kind of series that I'm trying to develop as a part of my portfolio that I, I guess I call the serialized novella series, which basically <clears throat> is me writing out a series in form of, in the form of episodes, okay, in the episodic format, such that if somebody were to take that series and translate it into television, Basically, they have a one-to-one -one transformation to make. They don't have to, they have to do some adaptation, but the episodes are already formatted and de designed and developed in the, in the vein of it being a TV series. So it's a very easy one-to-one -one transfer. And Surrogate is one of those series. <clears throat> I also drafted two other series, very briefly, very, very briefly, and that's the Kingmaker series and the Beyond My Reach series which are middling series that are kind of in the ether right now, but I just felt inspired to work on them. And even though I'm trying to develop a deeper focus on one project at a time, I can't really ignore when the muse is telling me also to work on something else. I don't like ignoring that. So um, that is basically that, guys. Got a lot done in the novel realm, the TV writing realm, the world building and shadow development realm, directing, dramaturgy, marketing, brands, and business building realm, career realm. And um, I just want to finish off this podcast with a couple of like brief notes that um, I had mentioned earlier that this year was also going to be the year of Creative Uni. And usually my Creative Uni is insane because I had a lot of flexible time in graduate school, which was so helpful and so useful to me. Um, this year, <clears throat> my creative uni has been more limited, but I still got a lot done. I was actually able to read a total of 20 books this year, which is um, 20 books, plays, and scripts. Let me put it that way. Last year, I got a lot more read because I had more time, but I really like to try to keep up on my knowledge and um, keep up on my craft by reading actual works, actual plays, actual scripts and also reading um, nonfiction books, self-help books, and uh, fiction books. I'm like, what else do I read? Um, and I really have enjoyed that. Just getting back into the wonderful sort of resting place of reading is something that I've been developing this year and that I will continue to develop to develop next year. Just reading for pleasure is something that I'm really jazzed about getting back into that I've actually started to get back into as of this fall, really specifically this December. And um, this summer actually was like sort of reading for pleasure, but also reading to like hone my craft. But I'm really trying to focus for 2020. And I'll talk about this in my goals podcast on getting back into reading just for the pleasure of it. No goals, no nothing, just reading and writing my reviews or recording my reviews and then moving on. So I'm excited about that, but I got a lot done in that area this year. I was able to finish one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine courses this year outside of my course study, outside of my MFA study and outside of my jobs. Um, and most of those courses dealt with filmmaking creating shot lists, indie film producing, um, film distribution, funding your films, and creating your own TV series. So um, I really enjoyed my courses this year. Oh, also a little bit of directing. I also finished 
Jodie Foster's directing, filmmaking masterclass at masterclass.com. So uh, you guys know that I'm all about learning on my own, being an autodidact. I love it. It's wonderful. And I will definitely continue it throughout this year by revamping my schedule, revamping my focus, and I'm excited about that. The final thing that I did this year, this is the final, final note, is that I really got into building my creative plan for the next five years, basically. Five and a half years, honestly. In 2020, I'm going to be the tender, tenderoni age of 35 as of June. And um, I don't feel old, but I don't feel necessarily like young, young. And so I want to make sure that my creative goals are focused enough wherein by the age of 40, meaning by June of 2025, I have achieved a lot more than I have already at this point in life. So um, it's just about refocusing, getting down on paper and affirming in writing what I want to do as a novelist, as a filmmaker director, theater maker, producer, dramaturg, game designer. Just getting those goals out and getting them down. Usually what happens when I write my goals down is that I ultimately end up achieving them. Either this year or in whether it's this year or, the, or three years in the future, there aren't really many goals that I can look at and say, I wrote that down and I didn't achieve it. Usually if I write something down and I don't achieve it, it's because I edited the goal or I changed the goal or I got a new piece of information that led me in a different direction. So I don't even see that as a failure, which is good. Um, but as of age 40, meaning summer, June of 2025, I want very specific things to have happened. Okay. Um, and I'll talk more about that when I talk about my goals for 2020, because I'll be talking about that 2020 to 2025 plan in that podcast, which is the very next podcast airing on um, January 1st, which is Wednesday. And um, that's basically that. But I just want to let you guys know that as a part of my accomplishments of 2019, I have actually worked on that one year plan and that five year plan for myself, for my career. And um, that has really given me a lot of clarity. One thing that I have been able to really achieve in the past year is understanding that product is important, but also really focusing on process. And that's for better and for worse, just focusing on process because we don't really ever know if the product is something that we're going to achieve. That's something that like we work hard towards and we hope is going to happen. And we, you know, if we apply ourselves, it most likely it will happen. But you know what else happens? Life happens. Um, surprises happen, both pleasant and unpleasant. Um, people change. People hit milestones. And you just never really know ultimately if that product you're searching for is going to be what you get. So even though you're striving towards a product and you should always doggedly strive towards your dreams, you should also focus on enjoying the process as well. And so that's what I'm really focusing on, not just for this year, but for next year, just focusing on the journey and not just the destination. I want to get to the destination, but if the destination is here, my journey starts like here and it's not a straight line between the two, I'm okay with that. If the, if the journey... If the journey is all like this, <laughs> uh, it's like so deep that my glasses fall off mid podcast. If that's how deep the journey is, but I still get to my destination, like I don't care. That because like, the journey itself is the accomplishment and is the experience and is life. And so that's basically all I have to say. I can't believe I just knocked my glasses off, y'all. Y'all can see how like passionate I am about the journey. <laughs> but um, that's it, guys. I'm sorry it took so long. Sorry this podcast is so long. But um, I, that's what I've been up to for the past three months, just getting my life together, killing 2019, despite the fact that I've been surrounded on all sides by dragons and haters. They've just been haters. I'm not even going to... Some people say that, you know, oh... 
why are you always focused on haters? Why are we always focused on haters? Like, I'm not, but I'm just being honest. They have just been straight up haters. <laughs> and just focusing on taking my sword and just cutting through the haters, y'all. And just cutting through um, all of the things in life that happen that we can't really control. And that's just how it is. But your girl is still doing her thing, still hitting a lot of many amazing milestones. As a matter of fact, for January, one of my goals is that I have to update my website with all of my amazing accomplishments. <laughs> and this podcast will be the start of it. So I will see you guys in another couple of days where I'm going to go through my goals for 2020 and also give you a peek into my creative plan for 2020 to 2025 is essentially like a five and a half year plan. And um, I'll see you guys then. All right. So until then, keep creating, keep it indie, stay badass. And I will talk to you guys in three days. Bye.